everyone and welcome back to Do You Even CSGO, the fast-paced tip series to end all fast-paced tip series. This week we'll be taking a look at the dankest of all grenades, the smoke, so let's crack on. Arguably the most useful grenade in CSGO and the one you should always buy first, the smoke grenade can be a powerful tool on both the CT and T sides when used correctly. Coming in at a price of $300 with a duration of 18 seconds and a cloud 288 units wide, it's always worth picking up one of these fancy artificial barriers that conceals players hiding within it and stops anyone seeing through to the other side. The smoke can also be used to extinguish fire, cancelling out the effects of molotovs and incendiaries. Now some of you may know I've already introduced grenades in a previous episode, including how to learn and practice set nades but over the next few weeks we'll be taking a closer look at each type of grenade in turn. In this video we'll be going over a range of different uses for the smoke on each team as well as some sneaky tips and tricks you can deploy to outsmart your opponents. Starting off on the counter-terrorist side, smokes are primarily used as a defensive measure to slow down advancing terrorists as they try to push onto bomb sites. As a CT, the round timer is your best friend and using smokes to block off key areas and run down that clock will leave the T's with less time to execute, increasing the chances that they make a mistake and gift you the round. This can be particularly powerful on maps with tight choke points such as Inferno and Cobblestone, where CTs can use smokes in conjunction with other nades to block off the main entrance to a bomb site for a whole chunk of time. However, sadly, it's not as simple as just throwing smokes at choke points and winning rounds. As with everything in CS, there are trade-offs to be made. If you throw all of your smokes in the first half of the round, you're left vulnerable to a late round push by the Ts, but if you leave areas open, you might fall victim to the enemy entry fraggers searching for picks. You also might want to consider leaving that smoke on your belt if you've got a friendly AWPer who wants to go for an aggressive peek at the start of the round, and never forget that putting up smokes will allow enemies to close up behind them and then explode through in a glorious hail of flashbangs, bullets and death. Clearly, deploying smokes as a CT is hugely dependent on context, but as a general rule of thumb, I would advise trying to hold on to at least one smoke on each bomb site as late as possible into the round. One of the reasons for this is the potential to use smokes in a post-plant situation. Blocking off certain areas as you try to retake a site can be immensely helpful, and it also gives you the ability to throw a smoke on top of the bomb and defuse whilst hidden from view. But bear in mind that there is still a fairly high chance that he'll kill you by spraying into the smoke. To avoid this happening in a 1v1 situation, you can try dropping a smoke on the bomb to fake a defuse and then waiting just outside the smoke for the enemy to peek. That's what we in the industry call sneaky beaky. On the terrorist side though, smokes are, unsurprisingly, a more offensive tool, used to block the CT's vision as you approach a bomb site, either allowing you to approach unseen or to zone off commonly held angles as you enter the site itself. For this reason, they usually play an integral role in any coordinated executes, which is why it's so vital that you learn a few set smokes to help out your team. The classic example of this is the triple smoke execute onto the A side of Mirage, where the T's use smoke to block off any vision from outside the site, allowing them to charge in, clear out the few remaining positions, and get that bomb down. But, as with the CT side, it can pay to hold onto a smoke or two for the afterplant, as they can be used to hold off the retake as the bomb ticks down. Incidentally, this is one of the most brilliant nuances of Counter-Strike as a competitive game. The team's roles are reversed not just once at half time, but every time a bomb gets planted. It's beautiful. In certain situations, terrorists might also use smokes as cover to plant the bomb more safely, as well as throwing set smokes as part of a fake to make the CTs think an attack is imminent on one site before quickly hitting the other site whilst it's weakened. We'll talk more about fakes and rotations though in a future episode. There are a few more things you should keep in mind about smokes. Firstly, you better make damn sure you know where you're throwing them, because if you get it wrong and block your own team off, you're going to look like a right muppet. This is particularly important for set smokes, because if everyone thinks you've smoked off a key area, when in reality you've missed, you'll execute could come to a sticky end. Smokes are almost entirely opaque, but you can see through the very edges without necessarily revealing your player model to the enemy. Again, this is why set smokes must be practiced and refined to ensure that an enemy AWPer can't find a small angle to wreck you through, but it's also the basis for the hugely annoying trick, the one-way smoke. As I'm sure you can work out, these are set smokes you can learn that give you the ability to stand inside them or beside them, completely hidden, but see enemies through to the other side. This is usually only good for one round in a match before they start spamming the spoke and expecting you to be there, but it can give you a great advantage just when you need it. One more thing you need to bear in mind, smokes are not brick walls. They're not bulletproof or flashproof, and they are certainly not playerproof. By far the most common error, even for players in the higher matchmaking ranks, is to throw down a smoke and turn their back on it, allowing an enemy to flash or simply walk through and wreak havoc on the other side. When it comes to pushing aggressively through smokes, there are always advantages and disadvantages to weigh up, so I'm sure we'll talk about it again later on in the series, but for now, I shall leave it to your judgement. As always, don't forget to tune in next week when we'll be taking a similarly detailed look at flashbangs, and if you have any suggestions or questions, please do scribble away in the comments below. Thanks for watching folks, I'll see you on the next one.